A-level history, again that's junior and senior year of high school, there was this girl in my class who thought the word opportunist was an extreme cuss word. It was hilarious watching her lose her shit every time I answered a question and she'd respond with, how did you know that? All I did was read the notes, maybe watch a few documentaries, read horrible histories, casually scan Wikipedia. This classmate of mine had a very black and white view of history is what I'm saying. So in year 13 we were studying rebellions in the Judah era and boy, when she heard about Anne Boleyn she just flipped. By then everyone in my year knew I admired Anne Boleyn and when this classmate asked our teacher if Anne Boleyn was an opportunist, my teacher said yes and this classmate proceeded to look at me as if I was associated with a far-right hate group. But here's the thing, opportunism isn't a dirty word. We've all done it at some point, and it's something we're all capable of. Have you ever been in the queue at the supermarket, seen another cashier open up and jump right in there even though you weren't next in the queue because you just want to pay for your food and get away from that screaming toddler in the pushchair? Have you ever established yourself as head of the group project because no one else was pulling their weight? Have you seen a gap in the YouTube historical community where no one has done a comprehensive series on the Six Wives of Henry VIII portrayed on screen and your board has fucking locked down because you've been furloughed and you may as well do something with your master's degree? <laughs> We associate the word opportunistic with the more political and financial oriented, mainly because that kind of career invites the competitive risk taker. But more often than not, when it comes to men, we praise them when that sort of thinking pays off. Look at Thomas Cromwell, started from the bottom, now he's on Tower Hill, but before that, he rose from the son of a blacksmith, to a drifter in Italy, to advisor to Wolsey, and then to the King's right hand man, owning titles from Lord Privy Seal, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, to Earl of Essex. And yet, Anne Boleyn also had ambitions. She wanted to introduce reformation to England, but she was almost universally condemned for everything she did. It's no mystery why the Catholics would vilify her, but in her lesser on-screen adaptations, most of her intelligence is removed and replaced with her wanting to be queen a just cause, teasing Henry with her womanly ways, because she was an opportunistic hussy who wanted the luxurious life of a queen. Look, if Anne wanted a simple life of luxury, it would have been easier to settle for the first gentleman who'd have her. Anne was raised in an environment that discussed change and reform. She sided with the idea of removing corruption from the Catholic Church, and by marrying Henry she had the best way of achieving it and helping other like-minded reformers. The thing is, Anne was a moderate reformer. She encouraged stopping the monasteries from tricking the poor and ignorant into seeing relics of saints for profit, usually because these relics were fake. But she knew that the monasteries had a positive influence on communities, and people relied on them for welfare and guidance. She encouraged the translating of the Bible so everyone could read and interpret it, as well as universal healthcare and education. This would take a while for everyone to get on board with, but it would have a positive long-term result for her country that the rest of the world could aspire to. Thomas Cromwell, on the other hand, was an extreme reformer. Shut down those abbeys, get your pope out of my politics, and do it as quickly as possible. The result left monks and nuns homeless and penniless. A pension was granted to them, but it wasn't nearly enough to live on. Think of it as universal credit. The two of them had an extreme conflict of interest, so when push came to shove, Cromwell exploited Anne's disadvantaged position as a woman and Henry's obsession over having a male heir to get rid of her so he could pursue his own ambitions. Anne's on-screen counterparts regularly show the friends-to-enemies dynamic between Anne and Cromwell. This is most prominently shown in Wolf Hall because, of course, we're meant to see this through Cromwell's eyes, and because Mark Rylance stares into the distance for every other minute he's on screen, it's pretty obvious who we're meant to side with. In Anne of the Thousand Days, Anne and Cromwell are allies, but there isn't much personal fallout. I would say something about the Six Wives of Henry VIII version of Cromwell, but I think I'm going to have to save that for a rankings video on Cromwell because this is probably one of the best you'll ever see, so we'll save that. But personally, I think the Tudors did an amazing job at showing the rising conflict between Anne and Cromwell, where each of them got equal screen time and you can see the reason why they're trying to survive. For as long as men have written the history books, women who get even a little bit of power have been classed as sexually immoral seducers. Cleopatra, Catherine the Great, Marie Antoinette, and even Elizabeth I 
You don't see this dynamic too much post-19th century, mainly because the majority of controversial figures in the 20th century were men, and the only woman who springs to mind has a grave worth dancing on. Plus there's the whole rise of feminism thing, and a surge of female historians and writers telling their side of the story. But before then, there were so few accounts of history by women that sources came from men who were raised on the mindset that women were either dutiful caregivers, subservient to men at all times, or, now how do I put this nicely, le Jezebel. Unfortunately, when a lazy, uninspired, or otherwise hack writer puts Anne Boleyn on screen, you can guarantee they'll use this trope, especially if there is another character to make into the Madonna. Sometimes Catherine of Aragon is the Madonna, sometimes Jane Seymour is the Madonna, and of course, Anne's own sister Mary Boleyn is the Madonna. Who's ready for another Philippa Gregory rant? Okay, I am not attacking the person herself, and under no circumstances do I ever condone harassing or bullying someone, but valid critiques that focus solely on the work is okay. In The Other Boleyn Girl, both on-screen adaptations and the book itself, Mary Boleyn is deliberately rewritten so that she is not only the younger sister, but also she never went to France with Mary Tudor the Elder, and her only sexual experience is her husband William Carey, before Henry turns his eye on her. Oh, also, she's meant to be 13 when this happens. So, you specifically made her younger than in your source material. Juliet's age was the only thing you changed. Mary falls head over heels for Henry after being forced by her family to sleep with him a few times, only for Anne to ruin it. Anne is made into this cartoonishly vindictive bitch, hell-bent on luring Henry away from Mary, while Mary is pregnant and unable to sleep with the king. To be fair, Mary was a dirty rotten snitch when she found out about Anne's relationship with Henry Percy. So in this narrative, Mary doesn't have ambitions, doesn't really want anything except to have children and be a mother, which, okay, is not a bad character motive in itself, but by doing basically nothing, she gets rewarded because she stayed in her box. Anne, meanwhile, is an active character. She couldn't marry the guy she wanted. The king was starting to take a fancy to her and he can't have a son with his wife. Why not take a chance and marry him? And yet, she's punished for being intelligent and for wanting stuff, and it's no coincidence that she is the more sexualized and flirty one. The sexualization of Anne Boleyn is not so much controversial as it is annoying. There is nothing wrong with having a character who is sexy, or a female character who enjoys sex, but on no account should TNA be a substitution for a personality. I know that the sex scenes in the Tudors turned a lot of people off the series, and I understand. Much like in Game of Thrones, they were everywhere in the first couple seasons, but they started to get toned down a bit towards the end. Fortunately, they didn't depend solely on Natalie Dormer's appearance as her character, and she's just as intelligent as she is beautiful. It's time to stop writing Anne Boleyn in a way where you're wondering where we can put the first sex scene, and start writing her as the clever, ambitious woman she was. Because when we write her as a sexy woman that Henry nursed a six-year stiffy for, it invalidates her real-life counterpart, and suggests that she only became queen because of her appearance slash teasing personality, and is far more degrading than it is empowering. This was the part that I really didn't want to talk about, but I won't have it said that I tread on eggshells here. And really, we need to call out this abominable trope, because it's used far too often as a cheap manipulative tool to be used as a building block and nothing more. In ITV's Henry VIII and 2008's The Other Boleyn Girl, Henry assaults Anne. The former's context is that they're in the heat of an argument and Anne calls him out for his affairs and points out that she can't have a son if he doesn't sleep with her. He responds by forcing himself on her. There's juxtaposition and then there's your characters arbitrarily being replaced by a completely different person. Not only is it completely random with no build-up, it's completely out of character on Henry's part. The real-life Henry may have been a sociopath, but he was also a hopeless romantic. Why would he spend several long years wooing Anne with love letters and gifts and titles for herself and her family, if he was just going to say, screw it, and do what he does to her the second they have an argument? After that scene, it's never mentioned again, and Henry goes on in the next episode to have all these solemn, weepy moments, and we're meant to feel sorry for him after that. Are you high? But honestly, I think the scene in The Other Boleyn Girl is worse, 
The context this time is that Catherine of Aragon has just been banished from court. He's broken with the church. At some point off screen, they never really draw attention to it. The pacing in this film is terrible. And he just strides up to Anne and demands sex of her. She says, no, we're not married yet. And then he goes into a flipping tirade about how he has torn England apart for her. Again, off screen, never specified, show don't tell. And then he just has his way with her right there. And he's in such haste, he doesn't have time to take his trousers off. So it's this really awkward attack while they're fully clothed. And it's absolutely sickening to watch as it just zooms in on Anne's face as she's crying. And it's just like, dude, stop it. Just stop it. This version of Henry was underwhelming before now, but after this point, I just see a cardboard cutout with a grumpy face drawn on it. How is it that Eric Barner messed up two popular figures best known for their anger? This scene is nothing more than a weak attempt to shock the audience and suddenly make us feel sorry for Anne be because she's getting executed in the next 20 minutes and the audience has to care about that now, apparently. And this is meant to be how Elizabeth was conceived. Again, I ask, if Henry was capable of doing that, what was with all the flirting and the letters and shit. Was it because Anne said no too many times? Did you hurt poor Whittle Henry's feelings? Are you trying to tell me that Anne made him do this? Because that's how you're framing it. And then it has the gall to follow this awful scene with Anne sitting with Mary and Anne asks Mary what Henry was like with her. Mary tells her he was tender with a takeaway from that being oh I did whatever he wanted and he was fine with me. And now we're meant to feel sorry for Anne for the rest of the movie purely because of that scene. <sighs> Fucking hell. We don't need a scene like this to vilify Henry. I think the whole cutting off a third of your wife's heads, banishing one to die in poverty, humiliating another, and being five minutes away from letting your last wife get burned at the stake is enough. I'm sure he had a good sign. Dad, he cut off two of his wife's heads. He didn't just say, oh, you don't really get me anymore. We need to give each other space. He cut off their heads. As any good writer knows, if there is a scene that is completely pointless in the narrative, why is it even there? To shock the audience? That's just low. And showing the act being carried out, or even a segment of it, is reprehensible and insensitive. If you need to put that in to get any kind of reaction, maybe you're just not that good a writer. I've noticed it's mostly male writers who introduce these kinds of scenes into their work. It's a convenient way for them to write a strong female character so they can say, hey look, this happened to her, but look how strong and brave she is now that she's gotten past it. And yeah, this was one of the reasons Game of Thrones lost such a, a huge amount of traction towards the end because it just wanted to shock us and not tell a cohesive story anymore, starting with that Ramsay and Sansa story arc. A lot of actresses are also sick of this trope, and it's why Keira Knightley sticks to her period pieces where she plays feminist icons. <sighs> I'm so sorry to have possibly hurt or offended anyone in this segment and luckily that is now off my chest we can move on without it hanging over our heads but I had to address it because I just wanted to convey my disgust with using this trope and thinking it's a good idea because it isn't. I'm going to post links to hotlines of assault and for mental health in the description and I'm going to try and find one that apply internationally as well as in the UK. As we come to the end of the huge hurdle that is Anne Boleyn, I kind of feel at peace now. She's the reason I got into loving history. Well, her and this one history teacher I had at school, because it was one of the few subjects I look forward to every week, and this one teacher I had was really dedicated to his work. In year 8 or 7th grade, we were learning about the slave trade, and he did not hold back on the atrocities because he didn't think history was something to be censored. And in year 13, he had a lot of fun teaching us Tudor history. He did a lot of community theatre as well and he said he really wanted to be in A Man For All Seasons as Henry VIII. And speaking as an expert on actors in Tudor dramas, I think he would have been perfect. How can I describe him? He was basically like Tim Curry merged with Mark Hamill. But just the year before, because in sixth form you got two teachers per subject, the one who was teaching us about Russia from 1905 to 1945 was so boring, I literally fell asleep in his classes. This is the same teacher who thought ITV's Henry VIII was a good introduction to Tudor history, and when he brought in that DVD, I literally sighed and the entire class laughed, and I just turned around and I told the whole class, it's not good, okay, this is not accurate. You know, I could have gotten away with just walking out. <laughs> 
I'm just like, now nah, I'm not gonna watch this my value my brain cells. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with this. I just wanted to mention my awesome history teacher. I was going to study history at university, but when I found out about creative writing courses, I was in there, okay? And... But anyway, I hope I've helped correct some common misconceptions and put a new perspective on how we view Anne Boleyn. I still don't know what's on the horizon for how she will be portrayed in future, because in some way, the interpretation will reflect our stance on feminism and how a studio fancies to, to adhere to historical accuracy and authenticity. As of this video, Six and Wolf Hall are the most recent interpretations of Anne. Obviously, I'm speaking before the new series on Channel 5 has come out, so I don't know anything about that yet, just got a teaser trailer and a few pictures, and I withhold my judgement until it's out. A six is very in your face with the girl power, and it seems to be a silly musical at first, but thanks to Catherine Parr, we realised that the message all along was not, yeah, girl power, I'm better than everyone, or which wife was best. It's, true girl power isn't about tearing each other down. It's also about solidarity against the system that wants to keep you separated so they can stay on top. Wolf Hall, by contrast, seems a backlash against the sensationalist and overly sexualised dramas like The Tudors and The Other Boleyn Girl, where you see what a toxic place the English court was, and kindness and good intentions gets you nowhere. Anne is obviously being seen through a biased lens, thanks to this being from Thomas Cromwell's perspective, and because and Hilary Mantel clearly has a massive crush on Cromwell. But it shows Anne wasn't a bad person at heart. She learned long ago that if you don't fight to hold on to something you want, it's taken away from you. That said, I do still really like the Tudors, because once you get past season one, you see hints of the drama that the creators wanted to make, because I can imagine there was a sword of Damocles hanging over them in the form of studio interference that demanded sensationalism and sex scenes. The question we must ask ourselves is, when it comes to period pieces, if it isn't historically accurate, does it at least stand on its own as a drama? For the Tudors, I say, yes, it stands on its own as a drama. It's not perfect, the character got killed off. Thankfully, since Philippa has been so kind as to veto Star's media from adapting any more of her books, we will not be seeing a third adaptation of The Other Berlin Girl, because I was literally dreading that the Gregory drama universe, or whatever, was going to extend till the end of Elizabeth I's reign. It's a shame we didn't get to see what terrible casting choices they would have made, but I still dread the day someone casts Ed Sheeran as Henry VIII. Right, I think that brings us to the end. One more quick video and then it's on to Jane Seymour. If you're enjoying this series and you're looking forward to what I'm going to say about the other wives, then please leave a comment and like the video and subscribe because that gets me more noticed on YouTube because unfortunately the algorithm is, hasn't been kind to me in my past couple videos. Um, I was a bit annoyed when I worked so hard on that 1000 subscriber special and it got buried by the algorithm so it only has like 100 views and part three of my Anne Boleyn coverage um, it got copyright claimed by the BBC. I'm so sick of making you making videos with public domain music and people thinking oh I own that and then making me wait a month and I can't afford to wait a month. So if you could go and watch like my 1k subscriber special and part three again and just you know share it around if you like it and that and if you're a new subscriber I advise that you press the bell icon right next to it because sometimes you can subscribe but you won't get all the notifications which is really really strange and I know a lot of people are watching my videos and not subscribing there's only like two percent of people who watch it who are subscribed which is a shame because on the off chance that I get to 10,000 subscribers and that sweet sweet bronze play button comes in the mail I will do a rankings video on Thomas Cromwell. If we get to 25,000 subscribers, I'll do Mary the First. If I get to 50,000 subscribers, I'll do Henry VIII. If I get to 75,000 subscribers, I'll do Shakespeare. And if, on the very rare chance, we get to 100,000 subscribers, I will do Elizabeth the First. So get subscribing and make sure I never sleep again. But anyway, uh, I gotta go now because I'm going into town and I'm getting my highlights done. See ya.